First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Nanjundaya for giving this opportunity to be here. So for any biologist, matter is something non-living. And combining living with matter itself, the title itself is something intriguing to us. So <laughs> having said that, what I would like to present today in this uh, forum to you is the importance of being in shape and the kind of lessons that we have learned from studying uh, unicellular organisms like bacteria and yeast. Uh, this is where I come from. This is the School of Biological Sciences at NYSER, and this was the lab in April. It doesn't look any more like this. There are more people here and more uh, things to do here. And this is a nice view in the monsoon from my office, so it's a nice place to be in. So let me just take you back to the beginning when what we thought about life was or living things were. So that is living matter. And of course, this man did change our perception of life. Without him, our perception of life would have been very different. What he did at that time was probably saw some matter-like things using this microscope, which had some movement and depicted the, these in this kind of diagrams here. And this meant that this actually moved from this position to this position. So they were motile. And interestingly, he called them animalcules or little animals to say that they were life because for us, only the animals that we see was life in that time. And this was exactly 300 years before I was born. In fact, the and today we know that what he saw was most of them was bacteria. And we have a bewildering diversity of these. And looking at this picture, you think there are a lot of images and a lot of diversity in shapes. But in fact, if you go and look a little more deeply, that's a rod, that's a rod, that's a rod, that's a rod, 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 and there's a rod, there's a rod, there's a rod, there's a rod. One third of them seems to be rod. Even such a beautiful picture where immediately you see such diversity exists seems to be rods and rods and rods. Why? Of course, rods are beautiful. There's a Twitter from Petra Levin's lab who works on size. And this one, they are definitely beautiful, and she says she's not biased in this. So. That's one aspect that rods are really beautiful. But the main reason comes from that we have been studying them for very long, and these are more amenable for us to study. And this is one example of a spore-forming bacteria, which is a Clostridium. These are spores that you see here, and just like a chick would break open from its egg and come out, this will be an, you'd see a bacterial cell come out of, pop out of somewhere, and then, yeah, here. Yeah. It's popped out and then it's growing and dividing and growing and dividing and over a period of nine hours, they cover the entire field in microscope. What are these? The bacteria. So in a landmark paper that Stanier and von Neil published in, uh, in this uh, article and called it, titled it The Concept of a Bacterium, they declared something very profound. They said there were two kinds of organization in this entire living world. One, what we have come to know today from these eukaryotic studies that there are these beautiful microtubules going around from the nucleus to the every nuke and corner. These are actin stress fibers, intermediate filaments, and these two elements carry motors, which carry the cargo and the vesicles that are, uh, Abdul talked about in the morning to every corner of the cell. And the other kind of organization was even more beautiful. Yes. This was absolutely beautiful. They said there is no whatsoever kind of organization that exists, and that is what were termed as bacteria. And in fact, even their division process, as you have seen from the earlier movie, was just to simply elongate and break in the middle, a fissionary process. This process was thought to be as complicated as a soap bubble, where it would just extend the soap bubble, it would, be snap, it would just snap at this middle heap. So that's how bacteria divided, as simple as a soap bubble, extend it and it will break in the middle and binary fission. And surprisingly, that view stayed on for nearly a century, despite the work of certain famous people like Frank Jacob, along with Hirota, where they identified in 1996 a mutants of thermosensitive mutants in E. coli. And what were they? They were this. E. coli would normally be a micron in size with a DNA or two here, and would have been of this size here. But what they isolated 
were the first ever cell division mutants. This is 10 years before the work of Paul Nurse and Hartwell, which, which won the Nobel Prize in East Cells. And since then, nothing happened until the 80s. It was in 1980 when Bay, F. Lee Bay and Lutkenhaus looked at these mutants and identified one of the last cell division proteins, or the first one that goes to the cell division site, called FTSZ, and by immunostaining, they could show that this particular protein localized at this septum-forming site, and it always was present here until the septal invagination was completed. And 10 years later, well, Lufthansa identified the gene 80, in 80s, and 10 years later, this localization was shown. And within a year, a few other groups purified this protein, showed them to be a GTP binding protein, and showed, them, showed that in vitro you could get polymers of this kind as viewed by electron microscope, and which seemed similar to a single protofibril of a tubulin. Tubulin was by this time almost very famous. And however, for today's talk, I would not talk on this protein. This I have reserved it for tomorrow. I will talk to you more about this protein. But today, what I will talk to you more about is this particular protein, actin, like proteins. And this, in fact, has an ancient history again in bacteria. In 1980s, Matsuhashi's group had isolated mutants of bacteria that were that had lost shape again from rod to spherical. They had isolated several mutants that would not be rod shaped but were spherical shaped. And in 1992, a landmark paper again from Peer Book, who heads the EMBL division of structural biology today, had kind of remarked something very interesting. What he saw was that he was looking at the secondary structures of actin and few other proteins in bacteria. And he said that this Proteins like MREB, FTSA, SGBA, all these look something like they should have a secondary structure similar to that of actin. Are they actin like proteins? But then they themselves had put that aside because there were also among that were proteins called as hexokinases and xylokinases, which were simple metabolic enzymes that would convert glucose to other sugars and phosphorylate or all, all kinds of things. And a heat shock protein HSP70 here. And why should these proteins have any relation to that of cytoskeletal proteins? So the entire thing was brushed aside. And again, bacteria did not make their claim to have had cytoskeletal proteins. Until 1998. What was this change? Ian Lowe and Linda Amos had successfully crystallized tubulin after nearly 20 years of struggle. And nearly at the same time in back-to-back -back papers, they all, um, uh, Ian Lowe also had the structure of FTSZ. And it became absolutely apparent to the human eye that both these structures were very similar, and FTSZ should be the ancestral homologue of the eukaryotic tubulin. They are so identical in these helical structures that you can see this helix, this helix going there, the beta uh, sheets that are here, which forms the Rosman fold the GTP binding pocket, not only that, the hydrolysis loop, the loop that comes down here from the top of the other monomer to hydrolyze the phosphate here, were in the perfectly, uh, almost identical position in both these molecules. And two years or three years later, Ian Lowe's group and when it actually saw the structure of MREB and actin-like homolog, and again, they had the same fold like actin. So here are the four subdomains of actin in the same positions. Of course, the handedness has changed now that we know the MREB structure here. So this is an old slide. Actin and MREB actually have op opposite handedness. So this visualization to us that these are the existing structures actually gave us the confidence that BAC indeed carried cytoskeletal proteins and they played an important role in function of uh, bacterial processes. And since then, we have known a lot of bacterial cytoskeletal proteins, FTSZ being the primary of them, with tubulin being the tubulin homolog, which forms these protofilaments. And in bacteria, it organizes the uh, it organizes the cell division site, or where the cells go on to divide. And there are a dozen proteins that it first it recruits there, and the cell wall forms there, and the bacteria uh, gives rise to two daughter cells. And here is an MREB, an actin homolog, that also forms in vitro polymers, and in bacteria, they organize into helical-like structures. 
this i will talk about a little more today and organizes the cell wall biosynthesis there and also plays a role in dna uh, separation and maintaining of cell polarity and here are the intermediate filaments equivalent to the uh, eukaryotic keratin and those kind of polymers identified first in a bacteria called as colobacter there is a protein called as crescentin that localizes to the inner curvature of these bacterial cells and is important to maintain the curvature of these bacterial cells and there are other class of ATPases that are known as Walker A class of ATPases, which also perform cytoskeletal functions in bacteria. But of course, one thing that is missing or probably not needed or not necessary in bacteria is the motors. We don't have anything in bacteria so far. So not only are there cytoskeletal proteins, but a lot of work in the last 10, 15 years has gone to show that these cytoskeletal proteins are very well organized into this tiny space of bacterium. So this, is, this length is around 2 micron or 3 microns. This is around less than a micron in size. Here's the actin that organizes into a helical-like structure. This is the FTS uh, Z ring where the septa will form. And there are other DNA segregating proteins which are actin-like that will push apart the plasmids or the chromosomal DNA in some bacteria. And there are also other intermediate filaments that organize along the membrane and give shape and curvature to the bacteria. So for nearly after a century of denying that bacteria do have a cytoskeletal protein and can actively maintain their shape or uh, how they grow and divide, or dictate how they grow and divide, today, after the 1990s, this was the time when I was doing my PhD in this period, and this is the time when I started doing my postdoc work, and since then, there's like nearly 50 or more than 70 families of act actin-like proteins and bacterial cytoskeletal proteins that have been discovered. And each day there are new functions being ascribed to it and what kind of roles they play here. So here you might notice one interesting protein, which is the CTP synthase, which is a metabolic enzyme. So I'll just soon come to it, how that is a cytoskeletal protein. How did cytoskeletal proteins come into being? So bacterial FTSZ and actin are the eukaryotic homologs, and maybe the eukaryotes got it from the bacteria. But how did bacteria itself get cytoskeletal proteins that can polymerize? So the evidence was right here in the paper that was then just pushed away, telling that why should HSP70 or hexokinase and xylokinase have actin-like folds? It so happens that with the discovery of CTP synthase, we have an understanding to that. So there are proteins that have metabolic activity, and their metabolic activity is somehow controlled and regulated by polymerization. So in case of bacterial CTP synthase, it happens to be that if you polymerize, you do not have enzymatic activity. And if you depolymerize, you have enzymatic activity. It's the other way in the human CTP synthase. So these proteins that were regulated by polymerization, enzymatic or metabolic uh, activity, they gained a function of cytoskeleton by binding to the membrane or giving an advantage. In this case, the CTP synthase was involved in giving the curvature to Colobacter crescentus, and such a curved bacteria would be able to swim better. And Colobacter, being an aquatic bacterium, was able to utilize that curved shape better, and as it could swim better, it got selected for. So CTP synthase, being a metabolic enzyme and a polymerizing enzyme, gained this dual function of being both metabolic in function and also cytoskeletal in function. And from there you can imagine that if you lose the metabolic activity but retain cytoskeletal functions, you could evolve cytoskeletal proteins. On the other hand, you could lose and you could lose the filament formation or the polymerizing property, you could become metabolic enzymes. So that's the reason hexokinase or other proteins do have the actin-like fold, and probably actin itself evolved from hexokinase or HSP70-like proteins. So that's so far with the bacterial uh, cytoskeletal proteins. But what we still do not understand, or as like in case of the eukaryotic actins, how are cytoskeletal organisms, how different polymer structures come about within a bacterial cell? Do they need any kind of nucleators that would allow them to form different kind of structures. For example, this is the R protein that gives rise to branched actin. This is the formin-like nucleators that would bind to the actin, allow it to polymerize in a linear fashion. 
So uh, do such proteins exist in bacteria or the differential morphology of cytoskeletal proteins is still not clear, but it seems like bacteria do not need any kind of nucleators. Their polymerization is extremely rapid or no nucleation event has been so far seen in any of the bacterial cytoskeletal proteins. Similar with the tubulin, there is a gamma tubulin, but FTSA does not need any nucleating factor, a distinguishing nucleating factor to form polymers like this. And one of the another principal aspects of cytoskeletal protein is their Rayleigh dynamic. What do we mean by dynamics? In actin, we know that there is a classical treadmilling where there is a polymerization or a high rate of polymerization as one end depolymerization or a very slow rate of polymerization on the other end. And if we were to make a bleach mark here or a flu using fluorescent protein, so it would appear as if this polymer was growing at this end, it was just treadmilling over this. So what you have is this part would keep shrinking and this part would keep growing. And of course, there is a classical example of the dynamic instability of the microtubules discovered by uh, Tim Mitchison. <coughs> Wherein you have the nucleation center, and from there the microtubules keep growing. As long as they have the GTP cap there, or the GTP bound micro, uh, a monomer is loaded there, it continues to polymerize. But as soon as hydrolysis happens here, and hydrolysis catches up the cap, this kind of structure would rapidly depolymerize. And as they are depolymerizing, you could stabilize with a GTP monomer, and that would again grow. So this is the classical micro, uh, microtubule instability. So the average length of the microtubules over time would probably remain constant. And how do we visualize these in cells and are these really happening in the, inside the cells? And in case of eukaryotic cells, it has been pretty simple. There has been this, what said, let there be light and there is light and this is GFP to biology. So there is, this GFP provided us biology with a lot of insights and one of the things that we can do is to just take this GFP, put it to any gene that you want, look at inside a microscopic cell. And so here is an actin, uh, simple yeast cells that is undergoing to, that is going to undergo a division. So here is the actomyosin ring that is going to form and this actin cables and patches that are moving and reorganizing itself into a ring-like structure. So this is with the actin. And these are microtubules that are doing that are dynamically unstable. So here is the nucleus which you don't see here. It is from the nucleus that the microtubule starts to polymerize. So if you see this one, this is polymerizing. And as it hits the cell tip, then it would rapidly depolymerize. So like this one, yeah, this one. This was depolymerizing. This one was growing. As that grows, so this is the dynamic instability of the microtubules. And what this does in this yeast cell is to actually center the nucleus. So why not in bacteria? So at a time when we were working with these kind of proteins, it was, you can see the cell size here, bacteria are really small, or the bacteria at least that we can work with are really small. Not all bacteria are small. So this is a, a human cell that we all like to work with and do a lot of cell biology and we can see them. They're really big and you can do a very nice cell biology with the existing usual microscopes that you have. And on the contrast is here is a yeast cell that is a unicellular yeast. Along with them are growing some of these bacteria E. coli. And it's not impossible to do microscopy as seen here that these are E. coli cells that have been overexpressing some of these proteins. Therefore, they're very, very long and filamentous. You can see these rings forming and disappearing. So it's not impossible to do some microscopy, but it would be nice to have bigger cells if you really want to do some cell biology. So that is where what we started doing is to take some of these proteins in bacteria, put them with GFP, and put them into a cell like this. Take it out of their context of their natural cellular environment, out of their interacting partners, and see what the cytoskeletal proteins would do otherwise. You could, of course, do this in an in vitro, in a test tube. But what this is provide you is a more cellular environment, where there is cytoplasm, of density that is like these of bacteria. So these are really dense cytoplasm and molecular crowding effects and everything can be addressed in this case. And the second thing that you could do is to, you could change any residue in these because these are not going to be functional in these cells. And then look at what are, what are the effects of such residue changes in these cells. If you do that in this bacterium, any residue that you change might affect its function here and therefore you would not be able to get any viable bacterial cells.
So this kind of provided us a very nice in vitro cellular system to us. So what we have done with such a system is to kind of establish the... Okay, so of course at this point of time we didn't know whether they needed anything from bacteria or not. But of course after this work we knew that there was nothing needed and they can self-assemble into polymers. So what we have done here is to kind of establish Fissionist as a system to study all kinds of uh, bacterial cytoskeletal proteins. We have studied actins like MREB. We have expressed nearly 40 different kinds of actin-like proteins. Uh, if possible, I'll talk about a bit about this tomorrow. We have expressed FTLZ. Again, we'll talk about, I'll talk about this more tomorrow. We have also expressed intermediate filaments and metabolic enzymes like CTP synthase have expressed in uh, Zimmer's group and they in, in fact identified this to be a cytoskeletal protein or a polymer forming protein using the yeast system. And Oyster Eng's lab, which uses, which studies uh, chloroplast FTSZ. Chloroplast also divide by FTSZ because they have a bacterial origin. They have two of them. And their lab has used fission yeast and the other yeast to study how the two FTSZs interact with each other and how the polymer dynamics are affected in the presence and absence of the other one. And we have also identified from Archaea an escort-like protein that is cytoskeletal-like, performs cytoskeletal-like functions, forms polymers. And in fact, in this particular Archaea, it is an escort-3 uh, uh, that does the division function. So this is a result of just a snapshot of what we had done using the yeast system. This is the actin-like protein expressed in uh, pombe cells. These are round cells. I'll come back to this. This is the tubulin or the FTSZ-like protein that forms ring-like structures in yeast. I will talk more about this process tomorrow. And there's another tubulin-like protein that serendipitously went into the yeast nucleus and could deform yeast nucleus. And we have used this property of deformation to calculate some uh, forces generated by these uh, tubulin-like proteins. And it turns out that these tubulin have the same kind of strength like that of the microtubules of, in the eukaryotes. So what we are interested currently in the lab is to study partitioning of the cytokinesis, uh, of the cytoplasm, that is cytokinesis, how FTS uh, Z organizes itself at the mid-cell site and contributes to cell division and what are the kind of interactions that is needed with FTSZ. I'll talk more about this topic tomorrow. And the other thing that we are interested in the lab is also on DNA segregation. But this is not the chromosomal DNA segregation in bacteria, I, I must tell you that, because in E. coli, it's not very clear how chromosomes are segregated, but it's also a little more complex that there are a lot more processes that can uh, do that. But what we are studying is simple plasmid segregation in uh, E. coli or other bacteria. So coming on to, going on to today's uh, talk that I would like to talk to you about is something like this. So these are nice little rods here. So what I would like to talk to you about is how are these rods or bacteria maintain this rod shape and intuitively it seems like all these rods must have evolved from this kind of structure. Because the spherical is the most easy thing that would by, uh, by normal or what would be the normal thing to happen if you had a vesicle it will be a spherical shape and that is how life would have evolved in a vesicle and the vesicle should have been spherical. And it's true that the initial life should have been spherical but it turns out that the first bacteria were actually rod shaped and we know that bacteria actually, evolution of bacteria or the bacterial lineage diverged before the archaeal and the eukaryotic lineages diverged and first of those bacteria were actually rods and there is also size limit to the bacterial cells one of the best examples of this size limit or the tiniest of these bacteria known which are about 0.2 microns by 4.4 microns is this wonderful bacteria Pelagibacter which is slightly curved even for these dimensions. It has this curve like structure. And why are bacteria so tiny? It was simply because explained by the surface to volume ratio you have a more surface for the same volume and you could uptake nutrients much more efficiently and therefore bacteria are tiny cells. Is it? So this is a wonderful article by author Koch who asked the question of what size should the bacteria actually be. And based on certain calculations, it actually comes down to a size of 800 microns. But do we find bacteria that are of this size? Can bacteria ever be of this size? Yes, they can. What you see here is an E. coli, which I showed you as a rod. What you see here is what 
Abdul talked about a tetrahymena, but similar to that, related to that is a ciliate paramecium here. This is the bacteria. It's really huge, like 600 microns, and this is still the runner-up. This is not the winner. The winner is around 900 microns, but the way it achieves 900 microns is by generating a huge nitrate vacuole inside itself, and the cytoplasm itself is just 0.2 microns in thickness. There's a huge 800, 900 micron, uh, micron vacuole inside itself. So that's the winner in the bacterial cell size. So it seems like he was right that bacteria can achieve such sizes. Okay, this is the length. This one inside. Oh, that okay. That uh, there are several parameters apparently that he has used. I have not looked. I have not. I have not looked at exactly what they are. But they are based upon simple membrane architecture and nutrient uptake. If you are a free living and if you have indefinite amount of resource and if you are not in competition, so this is again coming from competition. If you didn't have competition, this is the size limit. You have an abundant so, uh, resource, and the membranes uh, are can get such large. But of course, these membranes are not planar membranes. That is what we discovered recently. There has been some report uh, showing that Eplopisium has membranes that are very serrated. So you have a very large surface area in the membranes. So it's not a simple planar membrane there. It's extremely curved, or it is very serrated membranes. Or imaginations are huge. So that's the size. Bacteria do come in a bewildering shapes. What we have seen so far is only these rod-like structures. This is the most wonderful review as, as speculations or arguments of what these shape advantages may be. This is one of the very nice reviews that I have really read through it. I have not completed reading the review because every paragraph that you read has a lot more thinking that you need to do. And all of these from those rods. So here, if you now put back into the evolutionary tree these shapes, it seems like rods are there everywhere, and from these rods is what you should have got about all these bewildering shapes that have come about in the bacterial life. They are appendage, they are helical, they are vibrio, they are branched, they are multicellular filaments, and these are like huge uh, filamentous cells. And as I said, the rods were the first ones as the tree shows that the deep-rooted ones are usually the rods, and the cocci and all other shapes are at the tip of the branches. So from the rods, cocci have evolved, the helix, helix shapes or the other kind of shapes or spirilla or whatever other shapes have actually evolved from the rod shape cells. So even among the rod shapes, how do these rod shapes maintain themselves? How do these rod cells grow? So this has not been very well known in bacterial cells. We knew that they grew somewhat in length, not in width much, but how do they maintain, where are their growth zones, everything has become only recently evident. So bacteria like E. coli, bacillus, and this colobacter crescentus that we have been studying so far, these are the most classical model organisms for studying growth in bacteria, they grow only in the middle. The poles are completely inert. There is no peptidoglycan synthesis whatsoever at the pole sites. And there's a set. And when they make cell wall here only when they divide. But there are other kinds of bacteria, like actinobacteria, to which the famous TB bacterium, the mycobacterium tuberculosis belongs to, grows only at the poles. Some grow at both the poles, some grow only at one pole, they become longer and longer, and they eventually divide by binary fission. And there are other bacteria that kind of make this prosticate kind of things and they, they develop a bud either close to them or develop a prostica and then develop a bud and the bud grows just like the budding yeast does. And how are these prosticae grown? They are also extensions of, the, extensions of the cell wall. The peptidoglycan cell wall synthesis happens only at this spot here and then it just elongates into linear rod-like structure. And just before division, bacteria like E. coli, they also make Although they have made the cell wall here and they are going to septate, they also extend a bit just before septation. So there are different kinds of growth forms. Even to maintain the rod shape, there are different kinds of growth patterns that you can achieve in a simple bacterial cell. How do you get to shapes from there? Simply by repositioning where you actually make your cell wall and how much you make. 
So this is one example which I already showed you, this prostate bacteria, they localize the peptidoglycan cell wall synthesis machinery here. Nothing else gets made, they just make this thin stock. There are other, in this, within the same family, they can localize to anywhere else. How they localize exactly depends on their cytoskeletal machinery and the signaling processes. But once they have localized, they can make their prostica there and achieve different kinds of shapes. And these are like actinomycetes or streptomycetes from where we get most of our antibiotics. They use other kind of proteins to localize at certain points the growth zones and from there they make their cell wall and grow. And then they have these long filamentous or branched phenotypes. But there are other processes like what I showed you, crescentin, a cytoskeletal protein, can localize to one edge of the cell, restrict the peptidoglycan synthesis there, so there is not much peptidoglycan synthesis on this side of the wall because this protein restricts its synthesis. But on the other end, you have a good number of peptidoglycan synthesis. So what will happen is that this wall grows at a much, this side grows at a much faster rate than this side, so you get a curved shape. Another kind of form is an active deformation where in the periplasmic phase, you can have cytoskeletal proteins that are actively deforming a rod-shaped rod structure. But all of these with the cytoskeletal proteins, but what are these proteins that are actually making the wall? So this is a huge complex which I, even though studying microbiology and taking several courses of microbiology, I can never remember what these proteins are and what they actually do. But in essence, they make the peptidoglycan cell wall with all their complexity to polymerize this peptidoglycan cell wall, make the crosslinks, break the crosslinks wherever needed, create a new cell wall <coughs> or a new peptidoglycan layer. And that is what all these proteins are doing in this outer layer. How they get there? The precursors are actually made inside the cell. They have to be flipped over through the membrane to the outside and then they are actually made here. And the cell wall synthesis machinery itself is connected underneath to the cytoplasmic material here with the cytoskeletal proteins that I talked about. Be it either elongation process or the septal invagination process. Whether it is the elongation or the septation, this machinery, there are different kinds of machinery to interact with this form or this form, but essentially doing the same thing. So coming to the actin-like structure that is shown here, which I will talk to you a little more about, how the bacterium elongates or organizes its cell wall synthesis around this rod-shaped structure. How does the bacterial cell maintain its rod-shaped structure? So it turns out that this particular protein that I showed you initially, that if you didn't have this in the initial screens, MREB, if you had didn't, didn't have this protein, E. coli were completely spherical. So you absolutely need this actin-like protein to be present here in the cytoplasm to organize the cell wall synthesis in such a way that the bacteria is rod shaped. If you didn't have this particular protein, the cell wall synthesis is happening, but it cannot be in a fashion to maintain the rod shape. How does that happen? So when MREB was first localized in the cell, it was seen that it probably organizes into a helical-like structure underneath the bacterial cytoplasm. And cell wall synthesis happens exactly over these actin-like structures. And if you didn't have these proteins, cell wall synthesis would be happening everywhere. It goes heavier and it gives rise, to eventually this rod converts itself into a spherical cell. But today we know that these long-range filaments are probably absent. This was not an artifact of microscopy itself, but because of the tags of GFP that we, all, we use always in biology. And looking at some of the dot-like structures, it seems like these are patch-like structures or very short polymers, not really long-range helices. But they move perpendicular to the cylindrical axis of the cell. So if this was a patch of MREB, and over time, it has moved, this patch has moved from here to here, and this is putting all these together. So these patches, several of these patches have moved in straight lines across the cell like this. And the angle is almost maintained at 90 degrees. And these are complexes that are actually bound with the cell wall complex. So it is something like this. So if it was, this was the plasma membrane, and you have these patches here, and bound to these patches is the entire cell wall synthesis machinery and that is making the cell wall but the cell wall is also being made in this direction if this patch was moving in this direction. 
So as the patch is moving, it is carrying the entire cell wall synthesis machinery and the cell wall synthesis, cell wall synthesis is happening. So cell wall is happening in hoops. And that you can imagine will maintain the rod shape if you are already rod shape. So if a bacterial cell is born rod shape, to maintain that you need to organize the cell wall synthesis in such hoop-like patterns. In fact, this is a, a cartoon is much more easier to see. So this was the original depiction that there's a long range helix and they are moving around in helix like picture. And it seems like there are these patch like structures that are moving along with the cell wall complex. But of course there is still some controversy in whether I told you that these cytoskeletal proteins are actin like. And actin like proteins have the property of treadmilling. That is they are polymerizing at one end and depolymerizing at one end. So what is driving the cell wall synthesis? Is it the cell wall strand polymerization itself? Or is it the actin polymerization depolymerization cycle? So there seems to be controversial evidence for both of them. It seems like actin treadmilling is not needed. And it is the cell wall machinery that is actually carrying this actin. And the actin is simply serving as a load bearing structure. For example, like this here. So this is a cartoon. This is the cell wall synthetic machinery that is making the cell wall and the strands of the peptidoglycan. And the actin is simply bound to that below the cytoplasmic membrane here and this is acting like a load bearing structure to make the cell wall in some kind of straight line hoops and it, this itself does not depend on its ATPase activity or the treadmilling activity. So how do you get curved structure using the same kind of system? So this is the MREB that needs to interact with the earlier molecule that I showed you crescentin that localizes to one side of the cell. So if you had crescentin it localizes to one side of the cell and then it somehow prevents MREB from loading on the cell wall synthesis biosynthetic machinery there completely. So there is a very low amount of cell wall synthesis or very slow rate of cell wall synthesis on this side. But on the other side, the cell wall synthesis machinery is much active and there is a lot of hoops of cell wall strands or peptidoglycan strands being synthesized. So on one hand, on one side you have a lot of cell wall synthesis happening. On the other hand, you have very little. So this kind of structure can give rise to a completely curved like structure. So that is what crescentin is doing. Of course, there are more interesting shapes in bacteria controlled by the same MREB structure. In this case, this is not a single bacteria. It is chain of bacteria that are linked together. And in green light, they are highly photosynthetic and they also are growing very well. And they are more rod shaped structures which are stuck together and that gives rise to a helical pitch here. But when the same rod like structures are now shorter, their pitch reduces. So that is what happens in the red cell. And how does that happen? In green light, there is some kind of transcription factors. The red light activates this transcription factor that blocks this MREB expression. So in this case, there is not much MREB. So not much uh, cell wall synthesis or not an organized cell wall synthesis. The cells are not rod, they are more shorter and they have a shorter pitch. But shifting to green light, this activates this particular protein and this activates MREB expression. There is more MREB, you get longer cells that are now helical cells. And this in fact is not, has been not used simply for fascination of the spring-like structures that look very interesting. What people have done with these, it's a species of spirulina, they have used these algae to template copper wires of different helicity and different pitches. So you can dry this and have electro, electro plate copper over this and then remove the cells and you can get a copper material, uh, a wire of copper with these helical pitches here. And why is it important to lives and to human lives all these simple rod shaped cells? So one of these bacterium that is helicobacter that is highly pathogenic and causes gas gastric cancer in humans is a helical shaped bacteria. And it is just not the MREB that localizes cell wall synthesis there and in this particular bacterium MREB now activates or complexes with several cell wall synthesis and cell wall degrading enzymes in different localizations and eventually what you can get here by these are the blue marks or the pink marks or the blue marks are simple simply showing that it is in these places that the cell wall remodeling happens. That the peptide bonds are broken and you have a shorter, more peptoglycan synthesis there, so you have a higher curvature there. 
and then you can generate these are other molecules that are involved in such bond breakages between the cell wall cell wall itself between these peptide bonds between these strand strand interactions so different molecules do different things and break to different pitches or different extents and in combination with mreb and these give rise to complex shape shapes from the very simple rod so you can get helices of different pitches you can get curved cells you can get helical cells this is the helical rod of helico helicobacter and the more detailed modeling from kc huang's lab and githai zamas lab have shown what you need to grow from this kind of a rod to grow to this kind of a rod and in fact if you can just have static actin polymers it doesn't work you start to generate these kind of pitches and these kind of uh, with irregularities in the rod shape bacteria but if the mrb patches are rotating and are more uniform and cell wall synthesis happens in a more uniform manner you can get a more uniform rod shape cells so this is another example where from the rod shape cell because of a selective advantage you have got a cocci so neisseria i think most of you know is also a pathogen that is uh, prevalent in lot of uh, hospital bone infections and other places so originally or the ancestral neisseria rod shape cells the really cylindrical cells having all kinds of the all the cell wall synthesis machinery that is there and from these neisseria the two of them that are most clinically pathogenic here is the neisseria gonorrhoe which has become more like cocci has lost many of these genes the mreb cd but in fact what they point out in this paper is the loss of a single gene called as yakf is actually responsible for this transition from rod shape to cocci and when this cocci transition happened there are other adaptive changes in bacteria that has definitely happened and from this rod shape these cocci have a selective advantage particularly in the uh, point of infection wherever they are uh, thriving on so the loss of a single gene from the rod shape cells can lead rise uh, can give rise to a stable cocci like phenotype given that there are selective advantages there. so this is summary of this from this rod shape cells have evolved so many of these diverse phenotype all by altering this actin like structure and playing around with where you make your peptoglycan how much you make your peptoglycan simply by, by fine tuning just two of these processes all that is fine i talked to you about rod shape cells and maintaining the rod shape what if the cells are spherical how do you get from here to here this is the same proteins function are they in principle if you make an equally that spherical by some other means can mrb restore its uh, cylindrical morphology how do you get from a spherical cell to here so it turns out that mrb is also a curvature sensor it does not just direct bacterial cell wall synthesis but by itself is a curvature sensor and it aligns itself mostly in the perpendicular direction to the cylindrical axis in the rod shape cell and here is a time lapse snapshot of the time lapse where the spherical cell is now converting itself into a rod shape cell so mrb first localizes to this point and then reinforces here and you can see a lot more fluorescence in the rod shape cell and eventually the rod shape cells take over simply because the rod shape cells grow at much faster rate they can divide the cytokinesis is much perfect there because in these mrb or the spherical cells there is not sufficient cytokinetic machinery to form the ring completely they are deficient in dividing properly but the rod shape can divide much faster and they eventually take over the population so they initially localize to places like this and you make more cell wall you can transit from here to here to a uniform rod shape or from here to a uniform rod shape cell and kc huang's group has identified several mutations in mreb that can now give rise to a An entire spectrum of width in bacteria like these are different mute point single mutations in mrb can give, give rise to different width in bacteria so all of these mutants probably are now having a different curvature sensing or they have a filament with a different curvature and that is how the it is dictating what how much peptoglycan or what curvature of peptoglycan is laid down there and you can get different width here so what we did almost 10 years back when we expressed this east uh, in the east cells the mrb actin here with the gfp fusion of course this turns out 
these rods turns out to be an artifact of the GFE fusion, which I'll tell you later. But it was interesting to see that in the rod shaped cells, they organized into the long axis as they are forming these filaments. And this looked very similar to the yeast tubulin cell. This is the tubulin of the yeast, and the morphology or the first appearance looks very similar to them. And today we have also made a very functional version where you put the GFP in between the actin. Surprisingly, that is what is the functional form in a bacteria. If you had to take this construct, put it back in bacteria, this would work, not this. At here the GFP is at the end of these actins. So even though you break the gene into two, there's more functional form than the other one. This goes to membrane because MREB intrinsically has a membrane binding motif. It goes to membrane even in yeast cells, and you could probably see filaments that are in the long axis. So this is a filament here, this is a filament here, this is a filament here, this is a filament, this is a filament. So even in the yeast cells, MREB seems to recognize the curvature and orient themselves into the perpendicular to the long axis of the cylindrical axis. What if you make the yeast spherical? So they no more align, just like the microtubules here, they are in all kinds of random orientations. So this was probably one of the initial demonstrations that the cell shape could di uh, dictate what, uh, how the cytoskeletal organization could be within that geometry. Because here we had a system where the cytoskeleton was not related to any function of the organism itself. Because in each other case, you could have a mutant in tubulin and you will get the same thing. And in fact, later in yeast cells, studying yeast cells, what they could show is the same mutant that I have used here, the spherical mutants. When you put them inside a microfluidic channel, you could make them, these are spherical here, you could just push them inside the microfluidic channel around the same width of the yeast cells. And this entire organization of the microtubules that were half a in these spherical cells would be corrected. There is no genetic correction here. These are the same cells simply growing in a constraint in the microfluidic cells. And the entire microtubule organization is corrected simply because you have physically corrected the shape. And the entire localization of the polarity things changes and the yeast is growing as normal as this. There are no division defects in these. Yeast would divide at the middle and everything is normal with these yeast as soon as they are growing in this microfluidic channel. So you could correct genetic simply putting them in physical channels like this. No, because if temperature is different, there are temperature sensitive mutants in these orbs, so they don't persist there. So as soon as they are out, it takes some time to become spherical again, but they persist for some time. Because now the cell wall has reinforced only on this side. So after a few divisions, they will go back to their normal. As soon as they come out, there is reinforcement of cell wall is made here, only in the poles in the east. So as soon as they come out, there is a rod shape structure. But after a while, as the cell divides and everything, they would eventually become spherical because they have the, still the same mutations still exist. So over time, they would become spherical. So what we were able to show by this artificial system of MREB bundles in the yeast cell is that they grow in a bidirectional manner inside yeast cells. So this is from the point of nucleation. They grow on somewhere in the middle if they are started. They completely grow in a bidirectional manner. This is more obvious here by a bleach experiment where we have bleached the fluorescence here and there is equal amount of growth on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So they grow almost in a, equally in the bidirectional manner. Not only that, the way they align themselves into the long axis of the cell is to simply hit the wall. The wall is tough as they are polymerizing. Here they hit the wall and there is more polymerization and they have to orient, there is more space, they get on till the ends and as soon as they reach the ends, they simply stop growing. So why was this important? Although it's a completely artificial system, it turns out that bacteria maintain their plasmids in almost a similar way. So this is a classical plasmid called as type 2 plasmids and this is an E. coli plasmid that carries drug resistance in them, multiple drug resistance all the kinds of drugs, cannabis and tetracycline, whatever you can imagine, lies on this kind of plasma. And E. coli segregate or maintain their plasmids and ensure that both the daughter cells get their plasmids by a simple mechanism like this. So they push the plasmids to the cell, to the cell ends by these polymers. The red one are these polymers of actin-like proteins. And as soon as they push the polymers to the end, the cell would anyway divide in the middle. So both the daughter cells would have a plasmid. 
that's how they ensure and the way this polymerization happens is not simply in a linear direction as if a spindle is there and then the spindle elongates in only one direction but the way they do is, is to orient by the themselves along the long, long axis by simply hitting the cell wall or the cell membrane of the E. coli cells and that is where they end up at the both the directions so this was identical to these polymers so these are different polymers this MREB nothing to do with plasmid segregation or binding of plasmids but here is an actin like protein that binds plasmids and segregates so this kind of shows you how the plasmids are segregated so this is a plasmid there is a DNA binding element here there is a protein that binds to the DNA binding element this is the actin like protein that forms polymers when there is only one of them, the ATP cap, just like microtubules, loss of ATP cap depolymerizes, this is dynamically unstable, leads to catastrophe. But as soon as there are two, the ends are stabilized. And there is insertional polymerization happening at one end. And that is what is this polymerization. What you are seeing is only the polymer, not the plasmid. Here you are seeing both of them. So the polymer extends as insertional polymerization happens here, and they are being stretched to those two sides of the rod-shaped bacteria. And immediately you can see that the rod shape becomes important to maintain these cells because if these were not rod shape, these plasmids would be there everywhere and the cell would not divide exactly in the middle and the daughter cells would not end up having copy of their genome. So not every daughter cell will have a plasmid. So the shape does provide an advantage for these kind of systems. And shape does, in fact is more important. So the division plane can be completely determined by the shape of the cell. So here are examples where they have taken these large egg cells or urchin cells and put it in different kind of cell shapes. So they can force these eggs into these kind of microfabricated shapes here. And when you put them, where would the cell divide? And the cell division plane at least is dictated by or could be predicted by the shape of the nucleus or the extension of the nucleus here itself. So if this nucleus was so for this kind of shape, it is, yeah, this kind of shape, so this would be the plane of axis here, this would divide here. And if the axis of the spindle was like this, it would divide perpendicular to that. So this would be the nucleus. If the nucleus' is, shape is extended oblongate like this, the cell would divide like that. It could be predicted from the interface nucleus itself. And in fact, they had done more shapes and everything here, and they could come to a conclusion that the cell division plane can be dictated by the shape of the cell and here the nucleus itself acts as a force sensor and the microtubules uh, plays an important role here. So that was with the mammalian cells and what we could show with the yeast cells that the shape are important for maintaining the actomyosin filament itself. So this is the septa which is formed by the actin and the myosin. So in case of why I should have played this movie one by one, but sorry about that. So, oh, that's not playing. I need to go back to that. So that is the wild type cell where the cell divides right at the middle and the actomyosin ring gets fixed there, divides and constricts there. But in these you could You see that the actomyosin ring is somewhat slipping to the ends. So these are protoplasts of yeast, which do not have cell wall, therefore they are spherical. We made a protoplast of them digesting the cell wall away. This actomyosin ring would assemble again and again and somehow slip. They would never anchor and they would never constrict this. So one reason is that these protoplasts are, the turgor is high enough that the actomyosin force is not able to constrict them. They are almost like a very rigid ball here. So does it really matter, the shape? So what we could see in yeast cells, whenever the rings assemble in particular kind of mutants at the cell poles, we can do some genetic tricks to get the rings assembled not here, but at the cell pole. The rings forming here would simply slip to the end. Here there is cell wall. The cell is the same. It has the same target cell wall. If the ring assembled here, it would go on to constrict. But rings assembling at the poles where there is spherical geometry, would simply go on to slip down and they would never form a wall and constrict the membrane here. And that is true for these cells where this is deleted for this particular myosin, which is non-essential here. You get a nice cell here where there is a broad two kind of diameters in the same cell. So here is a larger diameter, here is a smaller diameter. 
So you can see that the ring assembles somewhat here, but then it slips down to this place, and as soon as it gets to this place, it starts to constrict. So it seems like the spherical geometries are somehow inhibitory for the actomyosin ring to be anchored and contracting there itself. It seems to flow over the uh, curvature of these uh, spherical regions. So this is shown in a chymograph here. The ring started out somewhere here. Over time, it just slipped here, and as soon as it came to this point, that is this point here, it just started to constrict. And this, along with Madanra, we could uh, show that the actin flow or the myosin flow somehow con on these rigid spherical balls will lead to slippage, like a rubber band put there, it would not just stay there. The, rubber, the contractility of the ring itself would slip down in a, a ball bearing. And in fact, what we have not been able to test out of this prediction so far is that they predicted that the myosin concentration from this end to this end in, in this actin, width of this actin rings, should be increasing along the diameter of the, uh, or along the width of the ring itself, which we have not been able to uh, uh, experiment later so far anyways. So the shape is extremely important to maintain. One is the division itself. So as Casey Huang and their group had shown that FTSE uh, uh, concentration is extremely important if the cells become more, uh, become more uh, increase in width. So you need more FTSE to assemble there and concentration remains constant in these cells, but they scale, scale linearly or the FTSE abundance itself scales linearly over the width. And the most important thing was these larger width cells were more sensitive to drugs. So there is a drug sensitivity or the drug treatment regime that could come out of this thread. So these highly bulged threads were more sensitive to drug treatment than the rods here. So the shape could actually influence more of our treatment things. And in fact, there is an idea that bacteria are more resistant when we treat with uh, antibiotics to us because bacteria no more exist in rod-shaped cells when they infect us. It's only when we take them out in cultures and look at them under microscopes, under our beautiful laboratory condi conditions that they exist like this. As soon as they are in our bodies, they lose their cell wall, they become pro protoplast-like and they are L-forms, they don't have any shape. So those L-forms are extremely resistant to any kind of antibiotic. So that is one of the reasons where most of the drugs are fail in antibiotic treatment of, in certain clinical conditions. So do bacteria enter into such phase? And if so, then how they develop resistance is an active area of research which is being conducted. So with that, I would stop here. I'll talk to you more about tomorrow, more about this particular protein, FTSZ, which is involved in cell uh, division here. So that I would like to thank all the lab members, Mohan's lab members, where I was doing my postdoc in both uh, Singapore, and now he is in Warwick, and all the current lab members were She's working on DNA segregation. This is Ajay who is working on uh, uh, FTSZ and Natasha, of course, is here. Thank you. Uh, slightly. General question. So you can see how you get curvature using these cytoskeletal elements. But in cells or across cells, are there conserved ways by which curvature is sensed? So you talked about getting mm -hmm. curvature yeah. and breaking off. But once you get it, what is the initial sensing uh, machinery for curvature? Mm -hmm. And and is that conserved across kingdoms of life? Okay. So Probably there is no conservation of curvature uh, sensing there. But how curvature could be sensed is probably the intrinsic curvature of the filament itself. So actin, MREB assembles on these lipi lipids with a very slight curvature. FTSZ also has an intrinsic curvature. So it's probably the interaction between these actin filaments and actin itself having a slight curvature, unlike the linear actin. It has some curvature and that itself leads to a curvature uh, sen sensing that it matches. So if you change that, then things change. So it may, be, but there is no conserved feature of curvature sensing so far across all the different proteins that recognize membrane curvature in bacteria. So uh, just to continue this, are there though proteins that are very good at recognizing curvature, not the cytoskeletal proteins or motors, yeah. but 
there must be proteins that are very good at recognizing curvature and transmitting that information subsequently to something, right? Yeah, uh, transmitting. There has to not be in the sense of that the exact is, signal, but there is the spore, the, during the spore formation bacteria, you get this, get this very high curvature. Where the mother angles, so what we are talking about is there is a rod shaped cell, and the mother is, is the spore formation, the septa forms here, and this is the spore, and the mother cell actually engulfs these. So here you generate a very high curvature in these places, or the spore itself is curvature. Or in this very high curvature, there are certain proteins that localize there sends these very high curvature regions and then signal to the spore formation or they kind of en ensure that the mother en uh, uh, engulfs the spore in a uniform manner. So they maintain that, curve they sense initially curvature, they maintain that, they reinforce that and they activate other signaling pathway that would now have membrane growth only there and grow in a uniform fashion so as to engulf the spore formation. So that is, is one example I... And this is not universally conserved, there are different sets in... No, different there are different sets, yes. Probably that is one nice thing about bacteria that you don't find conservation of... The principles may be the same, but you don't fi find conservation among the molecules. The eukaryotes is the other way, you have the same CDC42 doing a lot of things, you have a large number of diversity, but it's the same set of molecules that is conserved across eukaryotes that are doing these functions. But when you come to bacteria, you have the same kind of functions but you have completely different set of molecules with no conservation whatsoever doing the same set of functions. So which you will see probably a classical example is cell wall position, cell uh, cytokinesis or the cell, uh, cell division positioning is one example which I will talk about tomorrow. MREB has uh, an intrinsic curvature and uh, some people changed, mutated the MREB and changed the width of the rod shape. Is there anything with these? Intrinsic curvature? So that they are testing currently. So is there any curvature change itself? What happened to this MREB? What is the structural feature of MREB that changed and gave rise to this different width? Is something that they are testing. What they did is randomly metagenize MREB, put it into E. coli and sorted them using facts. Small cells, higher width, longer cells with smaller width. They just screened a library of MREB mutants to get those things. So what those mutants are and how they are functionally correlated to whatever they are observing is something that they are studying currently. Um, very general question, since both bacteria in the soil and bacteria in the sea, like other microorganisms, vary enormously in shape and also appear to coexist, at least in the soil, you can say that in the sea, because of churning, perhaps they coexist. How would you react to the possibility that their shapes are not adaptive at all, or at best weakly adaptive in some sense that we don't know? Pre-adaptive would be difficult to imagine, but uh, I don't know how to answer those question. I never thought about something not being adaptive in this case. Even in soil, you need, because the soil is there and you have a lot of branching, you cannot get away with the gust of wind or this on the rod shape. So you have a lot of branched phenotype in the soil. So I would imagine there is a lot of branch bacteria there. And, and as existing in the community itself, since they are sensitive, different shapes are sensitive to different drugs, and bacteria keep producing constantly. There is constant competition between them. They produce toxin, antitoxins, and secreted antibiotics and everything. There is some kind of competition and selection always there that might have dictated the evolution of their shapes itself. So I don't know if there was any pre-adaptive value to those shapes already. But one thing, clearly they all evolved from rod shape. So that might have been pre -adaptive. Even those rod shape must have been selective pressure that gave rise to rod shape is what. No, but my. My question is, could the variety of shapes that you see coexisting? You know, uh, yeah, uh, yes, they could coexist. Exactly. So, would that perhaps make one think that the shapes were not adaptive after all, but were neutral variants? Uh, they could be mutual. Exactly. The shapes could have come about by mutual variation, and they become to coexist. Oh, neutral variants. Okay. Well, that I, no, I, have, I have to think about it. I have not thought about it at all. Yeah, multi-stable states just got achieved and they got stabilized there simply because of drift on this one, without any selective pressure actually giving rise to those. But the uh, one problem in thinking about that is because they all evolved from rod shape is what we think right now. So because the rod already existed and from there when you lose something, you probably needed some kind of adaptive thing to stabilize that kind of shape. So that is 
So there's not much enough evidence to say anything on those lines anyway. So we cannot generally make a command right now. The only examples that I showed you were actually having a selective advantage and because we are studying them because they are involved in pathogenesis and this one. So other examples, whether were they actually adaptive, were they, did they have any selective advantage is something that I think we need to study shape in much broader sense. So I have one question. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, polymerizing in one end and depolymerizing in the other end for the movement. So is there some signaling happening which shows the direction for that? As in no, there is no signaling. It is just the time delay of ATP hydrolysis and the phosphate release. So once two molecules have come together, the rate of ATP hydrolysis, and sometimes it is just the ATP hydrolysis, and sometimes you cannot release the phosphate. So until the phosphate is released, the monomer is not released. So there is a time delay in phosphate release. So it's simply the time delay in ATP hydrolysis and phosphate release would give rise to different. And the interaction affinity between the monomers and the filament itself. So completely dictated by the biochemistry of the polymer and the monomer ATP phosphate interactions. Okay, this is. Ah, so, um, just some anecdotal evidence has come to mind right now, but I can think of some biases of rod cell cells tending to have um, symmetric cell division and and rounded cells having more examples of rounded cells having asymmetric cell division. Is there something on this or is there any idea on this? This just came to my but head right now, so I haven't thought through this. Okay, but at least through the evidences from bacteria, what is studied now, Diplococcus, Staphylococcus and everything, it's in and so many elongated bacteria. There is more evidence for rod-shaped bacteria having asymmetric division that's what I, than that's what I, No, that's what I meant. But is yeah. there something... No, but not many cocci have been studied so you can't like, generalize yeah, and in a spherical bacteria asymmetry is something i don't know how do you again unless they elongate a bit over cocoid kind of thing and then they have asymmetric division so in a spherical anyway the division is symmetric uh yeah or you could have elongated like in yeast where yeah, you, you have to thing. slightly elongate some some asymmetry has to be generated before you sure. divide sure. the staff is really interesting because it has a memory of its first division Divides in one plane, divides in another plane, then divides in the third plane. Doesn't do the same plane again. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking about the geometry and the constraints. So you said um, when the ring forms, um, sorry. Um, the rod shaped bacteria has more advantage than the spherical bacteria and division, right? So what about ellip like why are there no no ellip shaped bacteria? There are. There are. There are. Okay. So uh, same uh, same same thing happens. The FTSE rings form there, they are slightly overcooked, they have tapering ends. So they don't have this spherical ends, but they have tapering ends. So there are bacteria of those shapes as well. Where FTSE still pay, plays a role in division. Even in the helical bacteria, it is the same protein FTSE that goes to form this ring-like structures, but it's somewhat more asymmetric. It is not very symmetric. The ring positioning is uh, uh, is not very precise. In a rod-shaped bacterium, it's very precise to the precision of like two nanometers. It's right at the middle. It's just two nanometers here or there. Otherwise, it's right at the middle. Hello. Hello. Uh, if there is no question, let's thank the speaker again.